A common story. A player logs into a popular MMO for the first time and finds himself greeted by friendly faces who offer to show him around, only to be the prey in a twisted game where the weak are called by the strong. What's different is this player has been here before, and he bears a stronger connection to this world than even he knows. Struck down upon his creation, the terror of death is born. It's hard to explain my love of GU, as not all of it can be quantified. The emotional resonance with the characters, the fun I have with it, the level it engages me as a player. It's not something I am capable of putting into words. But I can tell you this much. It did not come from Roots. Dot Hack Roots was the first piece in CyberConnect's second Dot Hack project, GU, organized under the Dot Hack conglomerate. It is in essence, the second season of Dot .hack, with everything taken from Sign through the end of The Legend of the Twilight Bracelets and the other editions in that intermediary period, before this being considered Season 1. Though I still consider those after the original games, as I said in The Legend of the Twilight reviews, to be intermediary or bridge content between the groupings due to when they were produced. Roots itself first aired from April to September of 2006 in Japan, starting about six weeks before the first of the trilogy hit stores, before airing in November of 2006 to March of 2007 in North America on Cartoon Network. And as I said in previous reviews, I had no idea this had happened. Legend of the Twilight had so soured me to dot hack, and with absolutely no advertisement of the show airing, it completely passed me by. Especially since it aired at 5 in the fucking morning on a Saturday. Considering that this was my senior year of high school, and, as a teenager, I was not one to wake up before 10 on a weekend, even if I knew I was interested, there was no way I was going to catch it. I did not know a single person who would wake up at 5 in the morning just to watch a crappy anime. It's kind of my complaint about the revived Toonami as well. It broadcasts around or after midnight in place of Adult Swim on Saturdays, so the only people that would tune in for that time slot are the diehards and the adults, which isn't really bringing in more people to a type of media that is really easy to just license over producing original content. Made worse, in Root's case, by the last five episodes, never actually having been aired on Cartoon Network, due to the anime coming in advance of parts of the story, which it had spoilers for, I will do my best to minimalize. Reasonable, when you think about it on that justification, not wanting to give spoilers for the games. But 2007 was the year where anime on North American television started to die off or get screwed over, with pretty rare exception. But before I get to Roots, I must, like when I started this whole thing, Give us an synopsis of information you probably don't care about, but need to know in order to understand a lot of the stuff you're going to see, which happened before Legend of the Twilight Bracelet and this. As I said in the novel reviews, at the end of the Legend of the Twilight Bracelet, with CC Corp making the world more and more hostile towards AI, Ora decided to take Zephy and leave the world, descending beyond their reach into the Sea of Data, a massive collection of unused or passive processes and discarded data that govern not just the world, but the greater networks. And because of Aura's nature as the AI administrator, when she left, there was such a windfall of irreparable system bugs, normally kept in check by her, that the world suffered a major system crash caused by her absence in December of 2014. 
CC Corp attempted to save what they could, in turn making things worse by attempting to forcibly recover Aura or create a replacement. As such, staff members Jotaro Amagi and Jun Bansoya created the RA, or Restore Aura Plant, and were placed in charge of a division to make it work, called Project GU. Through it, they intended to reconstruct what they could have lost black box data destroyed in the first Twilight Incident. In specific, Morgana Mode Gone, but governed by program CC Corp would inlay in their new creation. And they would do it by recovering the phases and implanting their data into PCs the company would likewise control, based upon the documented fusion with the player Sora and his use by Scaife. All but one of the phases had fallen into the sea of data as well by this point. The last was Mia. Mia was hunted down in the remains of the collapsing system, captured, and her body, her data, everything that was her and now Maha, was destroyed to claim the temptress from her. GU recovered the other remnants from the sea of data and sealed them in characters called Epitaph PCs. They were ready to try and recreate Aura, or a dummy AI when Bansoya got cold feet and realized what they were doing. Not that they were creating a sentient being as a slave to run a video game. No, that didn't even cross their minds. What did, however, was the anti-existence created as a counter to Kite's bracelet, Kubia, and the question of whether their new AI would also spawn one due to not being made of the system. One more powerful due to the Epitaph PC's greater power. He stole the data for Tarvos in hopes this would shut down the project, as Amagi, seeking to prove himself better than Harold Horwick, refused to accept such was happening, simply creating a dummy copy of Tarvos to run the program and continue the experiments. The result, and likely what would have happened even with Tarvos, was every staff member using the Epitaph PCs being rendered irreparably comatose, and Amagi driven insane by his dummy. Worse, their test resonated with the programming of the world, destroying 80% of the game's data, and overloaded the servers, which set fire to CC Corp's headquarters. And thus came the end of the world. With their cash cow gone, CC Corp sought to salvage what they could, and merge the remnants they could get of the world with a newer game they were working on, called King Crimson, creating The World Revision 2, which was released a full year after the crash. The game had a lot more of an in-depth backstory as compared to R1's, which was mostly based off the epitaph of Twilight. R2 is set many years into the future of R1, but when you read about the entire thing, it kinda comes off as CC Corp being indignant, saying how human ingenuity slew the old gods of this world to create a new steampunk technological one. It's actually pretty fascinating the hubris involved while being wrapped in an interesting backstory. R2, however, quickly became an infamous lawless land, CC Corp's administrators not doing their jobs to ensure an entertaining and fun experience, as both system anomalies began to propagate, and a population of malicious users who made it their sole purpose in gaming to hunt other players, especially newbies, took over much of the game. Both of which were really their fault. The player killer issue would have been fixed with the addition of a PvP toggle, and the anomalies? Well, one of the more valuable pieces of salvage data from R1 was Harold Horwick's black box AI creation files. Yeah. Which, without any acknowledged result of the program like Aura was, or data management and collection programs, in the form of Morgana in the faces... Yeah, I pretty much spoiled where the eventual enemies of the games originate from though not the form it takes or how it acts. And Ben Soya, after realizing not only that the other epitaphs may fuse with PCs, like in their plans in this new R2, but also of a coming danger from their tampering, and thus snuck the Tarvos epitaph PC back into the system, and entrusted it to his estranged sister, Reiko Saeki, upon his death in 2016. Which we will get to later, as I like being mysterious, and some of the best moments of this series are ones that happen when you absolutely are not expecting it. And who am I to rub all the mystery from a game before we even start it? And for those wondering, I got most of that information from .hack End of the World, also known as the Terminal Disc, which came with the special edition releases of Rebirth. No, I don't have the disc, but there is a very thorough summary in the .hack wiki, and a few transcripts and video copies running around. 
I'm not reviewing it because it's pretty much just all lore building material. But with a new game and new ideas, the character creation system was completely overhauled, giving new job classes and even new species to choose from and diversify the game. So I need to go over all those. The races are easy enough, split into humans and three types of beast man. The Yaw tribe, which are large and intimidating, as if a man were reverted to a beast. The Lay tribe are humans, but with minor animal elements to them. Ears, nose, tail. This is where you'd file your stereotypical anime cat girl. Lastly are the Two tribe, appearing as animals that took on human characteristics. Effectively the opposite of the Yaw tribe. R2 has 11 classes to R1-6. Technically 7. And they're a bit more evenly distributed than R1's upside down triangle. The magic classes limited to cloth armor are the Harvest Clerics, the Shadow Warlocks, and the Macabre Dancers. Each can learn the basic spells of the game, but get more out of their specialty. Clerics specializing in healing and buffing status spells, Warlocks offense and ailment status spells, and Dancers all status effects. The medium armor classes are the Twin Blade, the only surviving R1 class, the Blade Brandiers, the Steam Gunners, and the Tribal Grapplers. I mentioned Tribal Grapplers in the Twilight Bracelet reviews, and yeah, they're pretty much just our Oka of the Heavenly Fist, but with armored gauntlets to give them power. I love the Power Glove. It's so bad. Blade Brandiers are a revised Blade Master, preferring elegant swordplay, and the Steam Gunners are a popular new range specialty class wielding bayonets that can fire steam-powered energy bullets. The heavy classes are the Edge Punisher, which is a revised heavy blade, the Flick Reaper, who wields scythes of deadly sweeping, and the Lord Partisan, essentially a fusion of the Longarm and Heavy Axemen from R1, who wield gigantic spears. However, the 11th class is the one most overlooked due to its initial weakness and slower leveling rate, going off the popular phrase, Jack of all trades, Master of none and not seeing the power it can obtain when fully matured. That is the Adept Rogue, which can allow a player to use up to three skill classes harvested from the other ten, allotted through a point system that limits choices for balance. The Adepts start off with one of the weapons, and can gain the others through in-game quests. We'll eventually see the power of the Adepts later, but right now we have the anime to finally start. Though, I should mention first login an audio drama prologue that serves as an episode zero for Roots. But it's only in Japanese, and my limited understanding of the language limits me from judging it for the purposes of review. And not mentioning it would just make someone call me out on it regardless later on. The opening to Roots, Silly Go Round, by Fiction Junction Yuka, is one of my favorites, if not my favorite, anime opening theme. I just love it. It's paced exactly at the rate that gets me energetic, and has a good lyrical composition. The scenery of the opening is paced well with the song, and the related imagery, though a bit lacking in detail or action in favor of the abstract, a common theme with the Dot .hack series, come to think of it, gets you interested in what it all means. Hell, I usually don't talk about end themes since a lot of people skip them, but Bokoku Kakusei Catharsis by Alley Project is another fantastic melody and goes well with the ending's overall imagery of the protagonist falling back into reality after one of the series' later events that, overall, helps bridge the anime into the first game. Hell, I was a fan of these two songs years before I even watched Roots. However, this is one of those infamous cases where, like The Legend of the Twilight Bracelet anime, the opening is better than the actual show itself in many respects. And part of that is how it feels like an addendum to events shown in the games. I use the CGI cutscene from the games because they actually don't show the incident of Haseo being PK'd, which starts this entire thing in the anime. This is one of my big complaints for Roots, that it is only there for how it relates to the backstory of the games, and not acting as a real prequel to the main events like Sign was. Sign had its own story, its own characters that, while not major parts of the games the main story happened in, were still relevant. And it's made no more obvious when the series opens with the man with the sealed left arm, Ovan, having already saved our protagonist, Haseo, from the player killers, speaking mysteriously of a power and destiny he is only beginning to know. You have a gift, Haseo. Something completely unique that only you possess. I don't get it. See what I mean? 
Granted, Ovon has a mysterious and elusive bend to him throughout GU, but this is the part of the story we're supposed to get us to care about these people. And, between the pacing, expressions, and acting, you'll never end up with that connection. Haseo is watched by another character, Philo, before the scene cuts to two female players, the Harvest Cleric Shino and the Cat Girl Tribal Grappler Tabby, who Shino just helped out in learning some of the game's basics. Which Tabby will regularly forget. She's not only a ditz, but an annoying character of the highest of calibers. Why is it every piece of didact media has at least one character I absolutely want to throttle? Hell, Pyros was never this annoying. And guess what? Pyros is a recruitable character in GU. Anyways, Shido gets called to meet with Oban at the Arcade Cologne Waterfalls, getting an update on their plan which involves recruiting both of the players they encountered, because they don't know which one they need. Cut to the headquarters of the Guild 10, where we meet Nalbi and Ender, two mysterious players with an unhealthy interest in Ovan's activities. Oh, and they run a merchant and information supply guild with a frontman named Tawaraya. Philo strikes up a conversation with Taseo as the Black Road wanders around Makanu, which has majorly changed since R1 being one of the few pieces of salvageable data they then renovated. The two tribesmen offers to answer Haseo's questions of the game, which eventually leads them to talking about Ovan and what he's looking for, something that does not exist. Key of the Twilight. What? It's always the Key of the Twilight. However, the key carries a stigma with it these days. People interested in it seen as outcasts. And it's odd that Ovan would be interested in just logged in new players, which makes them targets for people wanting to shut Ovan down. Such as Ender, who hunts Haseo down as he meanders through a dungeon, interrogating him on everything he actually does not know. And this ends up being repeated for episodes. See ya, little boy. Remember this line, it will be indicative of a verbal tick later. Haseo returns to where he was PK'd, only to run afoul of more of them, clumsily fighting for his life before Shino intervenes, saving him. Got to say, he's not had a good first day. I don't know you, but I don't want to go on with this game. It's so stupid and pointless. It's not stupid, and it's not pointless. Because we need you. You couldn't have, I don't know, told him that? Offered to help him get set up in the game? There are several ways you could have approached this, and we'll see later, leaving him alone tends to be the wrong one. Anyways, Tabby joins up with the guild, majorly crushing on Shino. And I'm not kidding with that. In fact, she seems to crush and flirt with so many people, it's actually a plot point at least twice. The other person she regularly flirts with is this guy, Saki Saka, a steam gunner who happens to be the only other member of the Twilight Brigade aside from Shino and Ovan who is pretty much irritated that the guild never seems to play the damn game in addition to searching for the key. Which is a pretty big complaint when you hear the reasons behind the search. Is it real? Suppose it's real. Then it will be more exciting. That's the hook. But once you're in, you're pretty much just hunting rumors and leads the entire time you're online. Which actually isn't playing the damn game. This is going to be a regular thing with these videos, but compare it to Sign. Most of the players there were interested in finding the Key of the Twilight, for various reasons. So they kept their ears to the ground for information about it, and while they waited, they played the damn game. Sometimes just playing the events and coming across new people let them find a clue. But they didn't just sit around and talk in lieu of doing something. Okay, that's untrue, but those were more status updates with the others involved. They lived. They didn't just repeat the same information ad nauseum over and over again. Ovan, and by proxy Shino's management of the guild, is pretty damaged by their inability to do things while waiting. And Saki Saka, while being an ass and antagonistic force in his own right, is just trying to say that, let's do something while we wait to hear or find something. Though, his definition of do something does not involve training newbies. As the third longest member of the guild, this is not the first time Ovan and Chino have dumped level grinding at newbie on his lap. And Tabby, being the annoying twit that she is, gushes over him, after a few sessions starting to call him teacher, 
as there is no good translation in the English language for senpai. I wonder if senpai will notice me. No, seriously, she is exactly like that meme. You have no idea how irritated I get by Tabby being dere dere. Anyways, I've been skipping around because this episode and the next are all about Shino and Ovon trying to get Haseo to join the guild, and him being noncommittal on the matter despite the desire to know more about the pair. Going so far as to ask Philo about the Twilight Brigade and get him in contact with two former members. The first, Beset, an abbreviation of Basset, an Egyptian goddess, is hostile towards being identified as a guild member, as it carries a stigma with other players, herself having left after she got absolutely filled up with Ovon and Shino using her for her own goals without giving anything back. It's the same with Gorn, who quit at the same time as Beset, who's now become vindictive, striking out on his own as a player killer that targets only strong players or other player killers which would generally be referred to later on as PKKs, in hope of becoming strong enough to surpass Ovon. And if you haven't guessed, it's also a running theme in Roots to be really obsessed with Ovon for some reason, as if the world turns on his actions. It gets old very fast. The games have a bit of it too, but only because of his involvement in later events. Here, he does nothing, and gets people talking. He goes to an area and gets people talking, he recruits a character and gets people talking, and makes them targets by people who are still talking. Now it'll be an ender. They're after something from Ovon, sure. Haseo, joining the guild and wants to know who he's getting involved with beforehand. Sakisaka, angry his guild isn't doing anything and blames the guild leader. That's reasonable. But people who left the guild, information dealers, player. Killers. Common players. It's just Ovon. 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 Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. And I haven't really even started to talk about the series itself yet. Anyways, Ovon makes himself out to be a dick by posting rumors about Haseo on the boards, which gets him harassed by players nonstop. Some thinking he'll give up rare items if they kill him. Others thinking special interactions will occur if you meet him. It gets so bad, Toa Raya, the public face of Tan and an information broker, approaches Haseo to try and understand all of them. An AI character whose player doesn't exist in the real world and has great range. Why were you never translated? He proposes an exchange of information, but as Haseo has said throughout these episodes, he doesn't know a damn thing about Ovan that others don't know more about him. Tabby approaches Haseo with another invite key, but... That does more harm than help. You're getting on my nerves. Thank you! Tawa Raya similarly gives Haseo an invite to Tan, and I'm actually curious on what would have happened had he accepted. But no, the third episode closes with him being welcomed by Ovan. It's okay. I can let myself in. Something that, if this was a competent anime, would have hit all these marks and been done at the end of episode 2. Anyways, episode 4 starts the arc that will last for the next 6, technically 7, episodes. Which begins with Ovan handing Haseo an octahedron, later referred to as a virus core, which is not within the specifications of the world's data. They've been found in areas such as the waterfalls, which are areas of the game the system administrators cannot affect or change, referred to as Lost Grounds. Very few of said areas currently known. Shino shows Haseo the Cool Grounds Cathedral, the only surviving piece of R1, unchanged and untouched, save for one feature. There used to be a statue of a girl here. And Shino says what I've already explained about why or left, but from an outsider's perspective. Maybe she just lost interest in the end. Lost hope for this world. Much as I have lost my expectation that this will be good. Sagisaka is irritated Ovan and Shino continue to focus solely on Haseo's development while he's stuck with Tabby. While irritation and anger seem to be his modus operandi, the reasoning continues to be sound. Episode 5 shows another of the virus cores being found, falling into the hands of Tawaraya, who, in concert with the plan formulated by now being Ender, approaches Haseo and Sakisaka separately about the core, 
giving information of their intended use to Haseo, while the actual item goes to Sakisaka. Naobi actually knows what they are, recognizing them as artifacts somehow carried over from R1. And the reason he knows this is because he was, in fact, part of the party that used them. See, you might know Naobi better as Takumi Hino, aka Wiseman from the Core.hack games, which actually makes sense. He was an information broker with knowledge of secrets of the old world, making it easy to set up as one in R2. What's worrisome, however, is how they've been falling into people's hands. <sighs> See, Ovan is somehow generating the damn things. And why would he distribute them for his guild to collect as a clue to the key when he's creating them himself? I don't know. Maybe because he doesn't want to put suspicion on himself? but it wastes time for his guild in searching for the damn things when he knows what to do with them himself. He has to know people with massive data crunching capabilities like Tan will figure out their purpose far before his small, underleveled group does. And they do! But regardless, these are used to sow discord, especially through the idiotic Tabby, who spies Haseo crossing paths with Ender with irregularity, who she is suspicious of because Ender PK'd her earlier all of it coming to a head when she draws conclusions about Haseo being a double agent when she follows him to an area, only to find Haseo being approached by Tawaraya. Oh, I'm sorry. Is being approached by an information dealer when the group is regularly hunting through rumors and information suspicious activity, especially when he said earlier it's who he got the information from? It's another problem I have with Tabby. She regularly goes from fact makes up a story to fit her worldview, and then takes that fiction and shoves it into reality as a new fact. Hell, she does this with Shino too. Taking the fact that she has to go offline for some time, she has a medical issue that requires regular doctor's trips, and twists it into going on a romantic date with a boyfriend that does not exist. And she keeps this misconception for several episodes after this. You do not take suspicion as fact. You take suspicion and verify the details. And for a member of a guild that is at its core supposedly all about verifying the information concerning the mysteries of the world, she's just another one of those women you know from high school that tries to believe the worst thing about people they don't like because they happen to be popular. I need a break. I'll see you all back here for part two. to protect and serve man at his best, not to be a guild of calamitous intent. 